So let's uh, let's start the session for the one who attend uh, online. So I am uh, Emmanuel Pajot. I am uh, the Secretary General of the European Association of Remote Sensing Company, uh, a trade association based in, in Brussels, representing a observation downstream company. Uh, ERSC is a geo-participating organization since uh, 2016. And uh, we uh, are involved in geo-related activities, uh, and we really consider that the geo and euro geo are uh, key solutions in order to support research to business. Uh, I have the pleasure to moderate this session, which will be a, a discussion yeah, this time, no presentation as such, uh, on the, uh, to boost the commercialization uh, of R&D. Uh, the title as such remind me of a discussion I had with uh, Joseph H. Becher uh, three years ago. Uh, he told me on the ESA side that uh, if they were really successful on the innovation and the, the research, they fail on the commercialization. Maybe failing is a, is a hard word, but we know that uh, Joseph H. Becher has a strong uh, vision and expectation for Earth's observation. When we look at the industry surveys that are Earth published every year, we know that uh, user uh, engagement and uh, access to new users are really one of the key challenges that uh, all the companies are facing in order to uh, develop their activities. If um, the Earth observation industry and the Earth observation ecosystem as such can be really proud of uh, the achievement over the last few years, uh, we can imagine that obviously, based on all the investment of the European Commission with uh, Horizon Europe uh, before H2020, there is absolutely high expectation, uh, obviously, on how to strengthen the industrial landscape or to commercialize. So uh, today, uh, we, uh, and I have the pleasure to, uh, to moderate this session with, uh, with uh, head and even contributors in order to explore uh, the current uh, situation. Uh, we propose and we, we prepare this session with three axes. The first one is to uh, discuss the different barriers. Uh, what uh, currently uh, the companies, so the ones who are beneficiaries of this EU funded project, uh, what are their view uh, on the difficulties they face in order to move from, uh, from research to, uh, to commercialization? The second one is uh, a deep uh, look on the different uh, markets that we entry in order to move from research to uh, operation on commercialization. So we call them uh, best practices approach. And the, the last one is about the current tools. Uh, need to understand what currently, uh, what kind of solutions exist in order to, to support the commercialization. So with these sessions, we, we aim to shed light on, on the common barrier that all the uh, Earth observation service uh, developers participating to EU funding project are facing and their effort to, to commercialize the outcomes and to have a, a vision on the tools that can support uh, them in this effort. So uh, to uh, initiate, I will uh, invite uh, all the, the contributors. We have one uh, online, if it is possible to share the screen um, yes no is it is it possible to display the one who is contributing to the session online miss uh, stella chakova yes thank you pleased to see you uh, so i will uh, invite each of the contributors panelists to uh, introduce themselves. And please, uh, Stella, be the first. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for this kind invitation. My name is Stella, and I am the EIC Program Manager for Space Systems. So I propose topics for the annual work program on the space challenges, and I manage a portfolio of space projects from very low tier out to high tier. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, then I uh, will invite maybe uh, Thomas. No. Push the button, yes. Thank you now. Yeah. Good. So, yeah, hi everyone. So, my name is Thomas Crone. I work for the European Space Agency Commercialization Gateway Team. Uh, we're basically a team we support uh, yeah, internal teams, uh, also colleagues in Earth, Earth, Earth Observation 
with market studies and also um, outreach activities. And then if you can share, please, the mic. Just go like yes, let's go. Okay, um, good afternoon, almost good evening. We are almost there. My name is Enrico Maldave. I am the former head of technology transfer of the Italian Space Agency. I am now a space economy advisor for um, uh, regional entities, so building space ecosystem and partner of a VC fund investing in aerospace and security. Good afternoon. My name is Beatriz Gomez and I'm senior legal procurement at Corvers Procurement Services, which is a consultancy firm based in the Netherlands. Uh, we are expert in innovation procurement and we support and advise contracting authorities across Europe uh, that want to implement innovation procurement projects. And today I'm here also representing the EU funded project PROTECT, in which uh, several uh, EU member states join efforts to buy climate services that use uh, Earth observation data to uh, tackle the climate challenges. Thank you. Good afternoon. I am uh, Cecilia Cerretta. I am responsible uh, for EGEOS for uh, the R&D governance. EGEOS uh, is an Italian company of the Leonardo Telespazio Group. We are also participated by Italian Space Agency and we, are, we develop uh, geospatial solutions from uh, satellite data and multi-source data. I personally, I am a mathematician. I have a, a strong expertise in space geodesy. I worked in that field for 25 years. And now is almost 10 years that I am involved in the process and contents relevant to the R&D. Good evening, my name is Giovanni Silos Labini. I'm the CEO of Planetech Italia. This is one of the Italian downstream company. Thanks, Giovanni. So my name is Lefteris Mamais. I'm co-founder and director at Evenflow, specialized in the commercialization of R&D results and also representing eShape, which has finished but has kept a strong legacy on supporting the sustainability of R&D results. And hopefully we can discuss that more later. Good evening, my name is Gaetano Molpe. I am one of the founder and CEO of uh, Latitudo 40, an Italian startup working on downstream services. In particular, our focus is to analyze satellite image imagery with artificial intelligence. So uh, we, I, we have a team of uh, data scientists that cooperate with uh, software developers and uh, system integrators. Thank you very much. Um, so as you can see, uh, in order to uh, to set the scene somehow, uh, we uh, have uh, in this uh, in this panel uh, three companies that uh, are can be seen as a beneficiary of uh, the different uh, EC funded uh, strong contributor to the uh, the ecosystem, and we have as well uh, institutional representative in order to uh, visualize uh, the two parts of uh, of this uh, evolution. Um, to uh, open the discussion on the barriers, uh, I have a, a discussion to these three companies in order to understand why uh, from each of them, which are uh, not a startup, but a small company, a really established company and a large company, what, uh, based on their experience, uh, are the reason behind this hard transformation of R&D results uh, into operational and commercialization. So I will uh, invite Cecilia in EGEOS to uh, share with you. Does it work? Yes. yes. Okay. So um, about uh, the, the difficulty to, to move from the R&D results to uh, full commercialization uh, of uh, operational services, I think that the first things that we have to do is a bit to enlarge uh, the picture because uh, obviously it's really very difficult uh, to uh, to evolve a specific uh, co-funded R&D project towards uh, operational services 
But, uh, uh, and when it happens, uh, really all things worked in the sense that it was completely okay, the technological partnership, the user engagement, the uh, clarity of the objectives, and uh, additional luck that uh, helped uh, support the project to be successful. To have uh, a general uh, management uh, of the R&D processes, uh, we have to wide the picture and to have uh, a more uh, structured approach. In our company, for example, the, the, main, uh, the main factor is the planning. We need to have an R&D plan for the medium long uh, period, so for at least five years, in which the strategic priorities are set up, harmonized with our commercial and strategic plans. That means that you can use also, uh, you, you can select a specific project, a specific uh, and specific uh, topics as a, a as tiles of a general strategy of a general puzzle. Um, for example, uh, a success in our experience, and I also my companion from companies, uh, I think uh, will share this uh, this thought has been the Iride program, Igeos Planetech uh, had were very successful from a commercial point of view and they leverage on the results obtained during the years of a specific development also supported by co-funded projects. So first thing is from our experience, the plan. Then also uh, the sustainability in the sense that uh, R&D in a company should be sustainable, not only from, uh, um, let's say, a financial point of view, but in particular uh, un under the, let's say, technological point of view. We have to, to be sure that when we uh, undertake a project, an R&D project, all the skills and profiles that are needed to best exploit this project are available. That means that the R&D plan should be also aligned with the internal uh, operational, operational plan. That means that R&D process must be completely embedded in the operational flows of a company. These are for the internal success factor, let's say. Uh, obviously, there is the external part. The external part is related to the correct engagement of end users. But uh, in that case, we can make a step back and again, uh, remember that the commercial sector of a company should be really engaged in that, also helping in selecting end user and to, let's say, to approach them and select them from a commercial point of view and using, ex exploiting them, the, the means of uh, the R&D projects also to, to have this, uh, this achievement. So these are uh, uh, in a very, let's say, in an outline, our uh, main experience uh, as a geospatial company. Thank you. Um, Giovanni, maybe uh, you can... Uh... Oh, yes. <clears throat> well, uh, uh, we need the today's session to discuss all the aspects. I'll try to go fast. Uh, um, first thing, uh, in order to develop uh, um, a research activity into a successful uh, commercial activity, you need a market. And uh, uh, there is a general failure in, uh, in Europe, in member states, uh, to build a new market. So uh, there is a chicken and egg problem. Uh, if uh, you uh, must have uh, first uh, uh, the demand and then uh, the, the supply, uh, but if you decide that, that the space and particularly Earth observation is a critical strategic 
element of European sovereignty and uh, also the same is shared uh, by single member states. So what you must establish is a strong demand from government. And uh, well, in Italy, the, we have uh, was mentioned at the Iri, the, there is uh, obviously the story of Copernicus, but uh, how much uh, of, uh, how many, sorry, commercial requirements are, for example, in the selection of uh, uh, the Copernicus mission for the next generation? And how much weight is given, for example, to the internal demand from the commission or from the member states? And this is one point. Second point is that uh, uh, we have a very fragmented industry in Europe. So uh, if uh, we want to compete uh, with US in this area, we must understand uh, that uh, we must improve our capability or integrate small medium enterprise. Uh, one of uh, the aspect, uh, for example, very strong in Iride is that, for example, we have a prime contractor for <clears throat> uh, two of uh, uh, the uh, main activity of the downstream, about uh, 25 small medium enterprise working with us. And this is uh, a way to improve our capability to respond to a uh, big challenge uh, like this. And third, uh, I believe that uh, we must also in our R&D development program uh, understand that it is uh, important uh, fail soon and fail often. So uh, avoid uh, uh, hyper-regulation and uh, go in the direction, for example, of uh, um, uh, contracting uh, method uh, like uh, performance-based contracting, develop uh, uh, innovation also in procurement action, uh, like, for example, the regions recently launched uh, dynamic uh, purchase system for uh, Copernicus uh, cooperative mission that is an exception. This must be the rule, I believe. Gaetano. Okay, yeah, I try to bring to this table the vision of a startup. It's clear we are too small company to enter in government uh, procurement, and we need to try to identify a market. So when we started the company four years ago, the, the first aspect was how to create a solution for the market, a solution that can solve the problem. And the question was, what is the problem in using Earth observation? And the solution is that the continuous approach to project and not to product. So our vision was to transform the approach of the use of earth observation in operative process that could be urban monitoring, uh, infrastructure monitoring, agriculture, precision agriculture from the project, single project for single customer to a product, one program, product for a lot of customer. And we put the customer at the center of our analysis, our design with a typical lean approach. We, had a lot of pivot in our solution. Now we are on the market. We are trying to bring to the market our technology. And the first aspect when we go outside the government, the, the institutional market is the evangelization of the market. If we ask to a lot of company, the, the position of uh, remote sensing is very low in the data strategy. Uh, also, if the data uh, is, a, is the problem, it's the king of the problems. Because when you try to create a sustainability project, a resiliency project, the, I, I say this because I served as a deputy mayor in a, in a small municipality in Italy. And every day is the, the problem was where we can find the data to take this decision. Sometimes the company, the municipalities, the government spend a lot of money to create the data silos and less to try to solve the problem. So with Latitude 40, Latitude 40, our vision is to create a product that can help the customer in this process using R&D. So we are a company with a lot of data scientists. We are trying to innovate this market with, with the application of an AI algorithm on remote sensing. So with our super resolution, we open the Sentinel-2, Im the Sentinel images, uh, put Sentinel image at the same level of commercial product because we reached one meter in resolution. We are creating a simulator that creates a synthetic satellite image that can, uh, can analyze the change of the, of the landscape. 
but these are not our idea. These are requested from our market. So the, the problem, I agree with the Giovanni, is important to create the demand and to evangelize the market with, with com, uh, using also tech uh, marketing strategies, marketing approach of traditional other digital companies, digital approach. For example, US companies are very good in this process. They start from the solution and, and they don't speak about technology. In Europe, we always put at the first level technology and then the application service for our customer. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thomas, you are uh, as part of the ESA Commercial Research Gateway, uh, the opportunity to uh, uh, be in relation with a lot of different uh, companies and your experience or the, the business cases. Um, you heard this uh, three company which really represent uh, the, the current European ecosystem. Can uh, you share a th thought on uh, the uh, classic, I would say, uh, difficulties? I don't want to use uh, failure or, or mistake, but uh, that you may have identified in the new experience. Yeah, I mean, I think some of the classic ones also have been mentioned here already. I think one of them is uh, a general understanding of your market. Um, part of that is also understanding uh, who are your competitors uh, on the market, but not just only from what kind of technical solution they're providing, but also in terms of how are they fulfilling the need of the customer? So um, I think sometimes what we see when we see a lot of business cases that they do a kind of positioning of themselves in the market and they compare themselves to other technical solutions using earth observation. Okay, that's one way of doing it, but of course there are substitutes on the market as well and that can also compete with your product. So sometimes this is, um, we know that sometimes this is, uh, we see this quite a lot. Um, and then on the other side, I think what we also see how important now these days is really when to commercialize a, uh, a product is also uh, your team. And of course, on one side, it's the, the technical knowledge of uh, developing the solution, but also how can, do you have people on your team that knows how to bring the solution to the market and how to scale as well? So I think this is a really, a really important part uh, of a team. Uh, sometimes you might have a superior technical solution uh, and you have someone who is maybe not so good in bringing it to the market where uh, another team has a inferior solution but has a very strong a person who can bring it to the market and they might win uh, that that kind of uh, market share so i think this is uh, something very very critical and also within isa um, i probably wouldn't have said this maybe three four years ago but we are more looking at actually the actual team and who they have, uh, because this is uh, just uh, fundamental as well to bring your product uh, into the market. And um, thank you. You used to word already, which is uh, scale up and uh, and market creation. Uh, and Stella EIC is supporting uh, uh, innovators to, to scale up and to to create markets. So, what are your thoughts uh, on this? Well, the EIC, we have the accelerator program, but maybe I'll, I'll share with you what are my thoughts on the commercialization barriers. I think the first one is that a lot of SMEs and startups start with very over-optimistic market estimates, particularly in the author observation domain. And I think this is quite misleading because uh, it leads to building a commercialization strategy which is not sustainable in the long term. The other aspect is often uh, when we start a high risk innovation, we see that customers, they're not very well identified and on changing requirements. So especially with governmental and customers, particularly institutional and customers, I see that requirements evolve, they change, and this is incurred costs for the SMEs and startups. But the most important part is that the companies, the SMEs and startups have a robust and long-term commercialization strategy which really looks not only at the institutional end customer, but also at the commercial customers and looks at the roadmap and growth. 
And here comes the EIC, because with our EIC accelerator program, we give 2.5 million for grant, but also we give up to 15 and above million for equity. And I think this is a very strong, one of the very few, let's say, in the ecosystem player, which gives that type of support for scaling up and commercialization. So that's it. These are my uh, little observations, let's say, just some initial observations. Thank you. So and it really brings to the next question, in fact, and to enter into the second pillar, because uh, you use the, the wording uh, market entry strategy. In the left there is, you, you are involved and you were involved in, uh, you mentioned eShape, for example. So you are in touch as a consulting company with a lot of different companies which uh, are developing solutions. So can you uh, explain us for you what are uh, the... Uh, uh, the, your experience on the difficulties on things that companies should entities should consider in this uh, in this step. Sure, thanks, Emmanuel. And and first, I want to make a sort of uh, realization that I'm very happy. Most of the interventions so far have been focusing on the fact that you need to understand your user, your market, in order mm -hmm. for any solution to make sense. And you know, we are in an event that. Users are a very rare, uh, you know, occasion and presence, and and I think this in itself is something we need to point out. Now we have been indeed working with companies, for instance, inside Ishe, but also more broadly, trying to understand all these barriers and all these challenges that they come across, and likewise with the user side. So some observations to add into the picture. One is that often people do not also focus enough on the benefit that the solution generates. It's one thing to have a, a technical, let's say, issue and just see that you have a solution that might be doing something to it. But then if you actually can help your user create the value in their own workflow so that they serve their users and you have knowledge of that, you are ahead of the game. And for instance, we have been analyzing in, in the context of ESA projects in the Sentinel Benefit Study several cases. This was a sort of universal aspect that companies who have managed to understand not only what the user needs per se, but also why do they need it? What is it that they're trying to achieve yeah. and how the whole value chain benefits? They were ahead. We tried the same, by the way, inside eShape where we conducted some socioeconomic analysis at the level of the whole sector. And I hope this is something, this sort of transition into benefit-driven understanding of what's happening that we would see more also in the future of uh, Eurogeo. The second point, and I would like to echo what Stella was saying, is that there's this naive understanding often of what it means to do market sizing. There's a basic thing where you say, okay, there's a super large market, I will capture 0.5% and you know, I have a very good business case. But then you look, do they actually have one single customer that is ready to pay for what they're doing? And this is very frequent, especially in, in European projects where we see good R&D, advanced R&D, mature R&D, that never makes this next step to actually be paid by anyone. So this is something that, uh, that we need to bring forward. And finally, there are also some small fixes. I mean, we saw with the sustainability booster in ESHA that small sort of pieces of change in the business model, like trying to see, okay, maybe it's not actually who, who I had in my mind that will be the one paying for it, it's someone else in the value chain or in the supply chain who would be the one to, to bring that forward. And I invite you, we have now also a, a page, it's called scalewise.space. You can see some such cases there. I don't want to mention individually any of those, but uh, there are some good case studies that bring that forward. Or maybe I should change my business model. Still, I'm offering the same technical solution, but under different conditions. And this actually unlocks real access to the market. Mm. So to some first observations. Yeah. And, um, well, when we speak about, um, about scale-up, uh, when we discuss with, with investors in order to support the, the scale-up, uh, investors always ask about this, uh, what are your users, exactly as you say. We were involved in Parsec and we identify how challenging it was for, for the companies. Um, but in the meantime, I could say that uh, often in the research activities that we have, it's a lot of opportunities to gather a lot of knowledge. You mentioned the uh, e-shape, for example, of the battery. Uh, this is clearly one of the tools that uh, has been used, implemented, and uh, will, uh, will remain. Um, 
Anil Kumar, um, you represent, in fact, the one who will help uh, companies to uh, to develop in order to uh, to scale up, which is really a, a really a challenge for for all of them. Uh, can you um, provide us with some best practices beyond your experience in order to to avoid the company to fall into this trap to be in the on the project based on ground ground based? That's, yeah, um, yeah. It's it's not an easy question, mm -hmm. um, but let me let me just um, let me just try to to give some reflections according my my professional experience. Um, let me add some salt and pepper to our discussion because everybody has been so politically correct Please so do. far. So let me just you know uh, put some little um, salt and pepper. Now, making a startup seems or looks somehow um, easy nowadays. We have a lot of tools, a lot of instruments. We have the ISABIC, we have uh, uh, regional or public funding, uh, we have business angels, plenty of, we have uh, the 3F, family, fools and friends. We have, you know, we can just raise some money to start something. Now, the real challenge is once you have started something, scaling up. And this is where, you know, the, the game is becoming hard. And if you want to play that game, um, you need to provide something that is, of course, of, of value. So, and the same thing is for the research. Now, what I learned in my, my experience is that even when you, um, when you publish a research paper, there's a lot of sort of competition. So um, you know who is the, uh, your competitor somehow, what's the research landscape around, who is doing the same research. So you have to hurry up if you want to be the first published in uh, Nature or uh, whatever, you know, nice journal uh, um, is it? And then again, it's like having the startup. So you launch your research paper, you make your research, you have your results, and then, and then the scale-up part is exploiting these results and doing something, you know, uh, uh, beyond that. So just three things, maybe, uh, according my personal, again, um, personal uh, um, experience. The first is that um, in research activities and exploitation of research results, um, there is a lack of uh, USP, the unique selling proposition. Why your research, why your paper um, with reference to other competitors is the best one, is the nice one. I have seen um, these two days were very, uh, I would say, um, quite uh, uh, educative for me because uh, I learned a lot. This is my first time here in this, uh, mm -hmm. in this group, so thanks for the invitation. Um, but, you know, always, every time I was listening to a um, presentation, I was like, yes, but why your activity, your research, your project is better than the others? And this I'm also um, telling you um, with the head of uh, an evaluator of the Horizon Europe space calls. So why? So that USP is always missing. There's a lot of things. As a VC, we have, we receive every day uh, one or two, you know, offers from startups uh, to pitch. And they say that, uh, you know, we are doing AI and uh, EO, or no, no, we are doing EO and AI. And it's always like, yes, but where are you standing in front of the competitors? So first, USP, even for the research part. Second is, um, um, I know maybe it might sound a little like similar, talking about research results, but again, the market. Your research result, the exploitation you wanna do, in which market will uh, will go? Who is the you know the the the, um, uh, the need? What is the problem you are solving? No, so it's like uh, I'm making a research on an incredible thing, but I don't know what is the problem that I'm I'm solving. Um, again, you know, there was this uh, local. We were just talking about that before. Uh, so act uh, uh, local and think global. No, the, the, in space now everything has changed. So you need to think global and act global. So whatever you are doing now, the market is global market. So it's 90% uh, probability that someone else has, is doing the same thing you are doing. So fix the market. Third, and I'm, I'm keeping a long story short, um, I'm not seen, sorry for saying that, but in these uh, days, in the few presentation I've seen, so maybe I have a bias that I've not seen the eye of the tiger in who was presenting. Everybody was, everyone was like, uh, I'm doing this project. This is what we have done. 
this is the uh, the this is the partners list uh, we have been granted here this is the results no you have to be convinced i've not seen the eye of the tiger and what is the the the, the right thing maybe um, from the researcher point eye of the tiger and maybe the habit of a kitty so be curious look at what the others are doing in in any of the presentation i've seen this morning there was a lot of comparison again i have a bias because i have a different hats but I have not seen that uh, we are doing this research and the other groups are doing this and this is our distinctive element. This is why we are the best one. This is why you in a later stage need to invest in our research results exploitation. So those three are, I'm sorry maybe to be a bit uh, harsh just before the happy hour. There is a happy hour, right? After, after the session. So, but it's, it's just, you ask my personal uh, uh, feedback. So this is what, what I'm, I'm feeling. So USP, market, and the eye of the tiger, even for the research. Even for the research. It's interesting that because for, for sure in this uh, research ecosystem, we have less this, um, this habit, let's say. Uh, in other aspects, uh, or maybe uh, when uh, maybe for in pilots, for example, we had Initiate or other um, actions or companies which are involved in cascade funding when they had to develop solutions and so on, they were much more focused on much more in line with this uh, A of the tiger, I would say. So it's a bit linked to the, to the community we are in somehow, but even I, I heard that uh, it should be the case as well for, for research too. Uh, hashtag, hashtag eye of the tiger. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we can do this. Good. Um, well, when you say I have the tiger, I think for me as well that uh, they really want to sell uh, what they do, so value proposition, but uh, as well incomes. But we could see as well the other side of the coin, the provider, the user uh, will be the one who may need to acquire this, this data. And it can be really a challenge uh, for them to, to procure Earth observation data when they are not really aware of it and they cannot uh, have the tool in order to do it. And I think in order to reply to this or to turn users into a paying customers, um, Beatrice, you uh, represent a project which uh, is working exactly on this topic. So the ability to procure Earth observation uh, is really uh, not a given. Uh, can you give some, uh, some best practices that you, you uh, learned uh, from your project or other activity, which could be adopted in order to turn users Users into uh, paying customers it could be from EO or non EO as you want. Yes, thank you. Yes, uh, so well, in, in Protect, we are still uh, in the process of exploring the market, understanding what is out there, and receiving feedback from the market. But uh, of course, the next step will be a conduct if everything goes well a pre commercial procurement. Uh, this is something that I would like to bring to the table today. Uh, because I, I, I believe it's also in line with uh, the previous contribution. Now we need innovation. And of course, public procurement is a strong tool to foster innovation. And in particular, pre-commercial procurement uh, is a very interesting in the sense that what we are procuring is exactly research and development services. And of course, we are uh, before in the phase before commercialization, but already in this moment, we can think about the strategies to force that commercialization, not to avoid the, the, the cold value of debt, not this gap between research and development and the commercialization of the solutions. So I, I always like to say that the pre-commercial procurement is very peculiar because uh, it's composed of, of three phases usually. So we have a first phase and we have more than one contractor. So we have several contractors working in solutions at the same time, which already give us a hint of different solutions that they are uh, working on. And we have a first phase which uh, consists of the design of the solution. Then we have a second phase in which the contractors uh, build a prototype of that solution. And a third phase in which basically the solution is validated and demonstrated. Why I say that? I say that because uh, this approach is very uh, suitable, let's say, for startups, innovative companies, SMEs, that uh, they don't have uh, most of the time, the commercialization, commercialization capabilities uh, to join other kind of procurement. For example, let's think about innovation partnership or other uh, more ordinary procurement. But in this case, because the contract is growing from the first phase until the third, the SMEs can grow together with it. So from the very beginning, we have this support. And uh, what usually public buyers does is giving a, a strong importance to the commercialization of the solution. So 
we require the contractors to say, okay, this is my commercialization plan. This is my strategy to bring my potential solution, not that this is still being developed to market. And of course, receive the early feedback from the procurers. And also in case, for example, no, the EU project, the EU funded project also of the partners and, and, and experts that form part of the consortium. So we have, first of all, early feedback. But also so something that we usually include in the contract is we go one step further and say, okay, but you have the obligation to commercialize that solution. And we give you a period of time, which usually is uh, three, four years. And if you don't commercialize that solution, me as public buyer will get the ownership of the solution and I will do it myself. So we try to support, but also give incentive uh, to the contractors in order to, to commercialize the solution after the pre-commercial procurement. And there is a still another strategy, which is also very uh, powerful that the public buyers could uh, use to foster this commercialization, which is, uh, well, when I once I finish the pre-commercial procurement, I will buy the solution in another procurement, which is a public procurement of innovative solutions. And this is important because it's a way to accelerate the, the path of the solution to the market, act also as a fair customer that give uh, some hints on the market acceptance, no? and also encourage uh, another uh, procurer, let's say, okay, this is working, you can also adapt uh, that solution or this kind of a reference. And uh, something that we are exploring now in other EU projects is the, the involvement of venture capital organizations in the PCP. So not after, but during the PCP and exploring the interest. And the results we have uh, had so far is from the perspective of the contractors. Of course, they are very eager to know what, uh, what the venture capital organizations have for them, not only in terms of money, of course, but also in terms of expertise, uh, advising the strategy to, to uh, scale up uh, the solution, etc. And also we uh, are uh, involving several public and, and private uh, venture capital funds that also are willing to cooperate. So, so let's see in this regard what, what the future brings, but it, uh, it uh, seems very promising. Thank you. Thank you. And do you have an example of uh, PCP in, in EO already? Because uh, we, we heard about a, a few references, but in the EO sector, uh, do you have example? Or do you have some knowledge about how it was beneficial for the SMEs involved in? Yes, uh, in this particular sector, personally, I don't know any specific case in which uh, yeah, the pre-commercial procurement has uh, ended up with, uh, let's say, a successful commercialization or the VC involvement. But we have a, a very nice example that I always like to share, which is the, the example of uh, Ocean, uh, Blue Ocean Robotics, which is a Danish company that uh, started being a very small startup participating a PCP to, to develop a, a robot in order to disinfect the, the hospital for a lot of bacteria. And from being a very small, uh, let's say, a startup, uh, it received several uh, rounds of finance from venture capital organizations up to, I remember, for, uh, $48 million, if I'm correct. And uh, now it's in one of the main un unicorn companies in, in Denmark. So mm. you can see, Thanks to this pre-commercial procurement and the support of, of the public buyers, it has started from being something very small to grow incredibly in one year. So, yeah, it's, I think it's an amazing example. And of course, we hope to see much more uh, in the same, same way. Yeah. Maybe, yeah, Giovanni. No, uh, first of all, uh, I, I had an experience with my company of pre-commercial procurement it was Marineo exercise in the last uh, uh, cycle uh, of uh, uh, framework. Uh, we can do another session about discussing <laughs> <laughs> uh, the failure of pre-commercial procurement. Uh, I just said that, that we successfully developed this uh, uh, product, but at the end, the municipality that promoted it didn't buy it. Also, they was very satisfied. Uh, no, uh, I believe the risk is that we look at the finger and we lose the moon. Because uh, have a look uh, uh, to the problem you described about uh, the startup mindset that are too much technical push oriented. Go in any meeting in US about this, and you will find the same concern. The, Normally, young startups are 
have a, a stronger technological push. Uh, if you look uh, at the venture capital in US, why venture capital in US is more prone to risk? Because normally as uh, the reference market that will be the anchor tenancy for that market. And uh, this generally is not uh, technology neutral. So they say we must use earth observation to bombing people. Well, we in Europe say we must use earth observation to monitor Green Deal, but we don't have the same approach. By definition, and the colleagues from the commission can correct me, the, the commission, but also the member states tend to be technology neutral. Hmm. And so if I am a venture capitalist, I have to invest in an area and I'm not sure that a market is there, I don't believe then the example you made that was a US venture capital invested in the Denmark uh, uh, company. Uh, we can say that, uh, for example, Synergize, one of the most successful startup in Europe in earth observation, it is uh, was by 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 planet and the way i am not uh, against uh, the exchange or investment uh, between europe and us but again it, we don't want to become a shopping mall for our technology successful company for us private equity and this is something that is very clear to Joseph Ashbacher and is reflected in the youngest and uh, the youngsters that are <laughs> <laughs> trying to change the mindset. And, and a, a small and that uh, because uh, uh, the there was some discussion about uh, the real perception of market uh, from uh, startups. I founded the Planet Tech Italia 30 years ago. Uh, at the epoch, uh, they don't call it a startup. There was another definition, uh, but one I proposed to a national program to develop uh, Planetech. Uh, they told me that uh, it was impossible that the market exists for that. So this also <laughs> encouraged young people to invest in this area. Nowadays, Planet, uh, Planetech uh, is uh, a, a, a turnover of about 20 million euros and uh, more than 150 people. Mm. So uh, again, uh, let's people, uh, young people fail, <laughs> as I thought, and, but fail soon. Super, no? nice. Thank you, Giovanni. Of course. Just one second, um, because VC was mentioned and so on. Uh, just to echo also what Giovanni said, um, we are always on the same page. So I'm, I'm very happy for, for that since many, many years now. And um, well, the PCP tool, um, it, it's good. It might be good, but only to, you know, to spark something, to start, because otherwise you feel uh, obliged to, to, um, to follow the rules of a public entity that maybe might not be at the same speed or the same velocity of technology or application or innovation needed. So, and this, if I'm not wrong, so please Stella correct me, is also what EIC is, is trying to do with uh, the different tools. So you are sparking, supporting, and then scaling up. But then you are not imposing some technology adoption or some other, you are quite agnostic in, um, in that. And this is also what maybe the real you know, PCP uh, should do. From the VC perspective, that is the, the, uh, the golden mine. So if someone is just supporting on sparking and then is technology agnostic, the world is changing very fast. So if you need to be resilient, if you need to change maybe your technology replication or innovation because the market is changing, the, 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 the target group, the users are changing, you can do it. Hmm. You are not you know, in that uh, uh, constrained, uh, constrained world.
in, in a similar way, I would say that uh, we as Earth were involved in a, in a cascade funding project uh, some time ago. And uh, we thought a lot of value in this because we had a lot of uh, startups we, uh, which uh, really benefited from the ecosystem where they had access to market knowledge and uh, technology approach too. Um, and it really triggered them uh, in order to have access to VC to uh, create the elevator speech, more or less as you, you mentioned earlier. And uh, yeah, there is different schemes which exist, and but currently this case funding are no more really uh, popular, unfortunately. Maybe it will change, but uh, yes. Is there any comment from the people uh, in, in the room at this stage? Ben, uh, yeah. could we have a mic, please? Uh, yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah, Ben Telinia B from Norway. Um, actually, <laughs> having a startup, but uh, I uh, I wonder uh, when we are doing the planning uh, from uh, research results to the market, what would be the timing on that? Um, do you have any uh, suggestions of what to expect? Um, how long? When to go to market or timing? No, the time because. Because we are we are looking at then co-design with clients, but even if you are doing that, it's not like, in my opinion, anyway, it's difficult to go directly from research, even with the co-design of a, with a client, within a year or two. Is in my mind is like more maybe five years is realistic. But yes, so we are nodding. Um, I would like to hear more deliberation um, on that. Left <laughs> days. Thanks, thanks, Patty. Um, I think there's no silver bullet uh, that you would have one specific time frame. It really depends on, on what you're building, who, who your customers are, and so on. For sure, one thing we see is that often projects, so let's say that one of your ways to the market is through an R&D project, because that's, that's what we're discussing here. If you enter this project without already having a plan in your mind, the different checkpoints that you need to achieve, not only technical development, but also the traction with your with your users. I mean, there's this whole co-design. Uh, I mean, it's not just a trend, it's, it's a very useful tool. It's not gonna happen ever. So that's the first point. Then the second point, and that's what I was mentioning earlier, is that, you know, it's like they say that, you know, life is the thing that happens when you're busy making other plans. So at some point you might need to become opportunistic. And, and we've seen it in Initiative. It's exactly what I was mentioning that the different pilots were coming in with a certain idea, and these were 37 pilots, so pretty much everyone in this room was in some way involved in that, who had been building this for years and years beforehand, so mature stuff. And then you see one opportunity, you, you pivot or semi-pivot there, and, and you target that, and, and maybe you will reach the market faster, and this will be your, your niche to, to capture. So I think you need to be basically responsive and, and reactive to that? Um, yes, there's no silver ballot, but there's no single vampire to kill. Because means that um, when you uh, submit a proposal and research, and then you study the market uh, part, I'm pretty sure that that exercise will be revised tens and tens of times. So it's not just, you know, once you design it and then the market will stay like that. So the most important thing is uh, having a continued conversation, even on a daily basis. This is what Silicon Valley says, even on a daily basis with your end users, with your you know, target group and see what they are um, looking at. To just concisely reply to your question, uh, the sooner the better. <clears throat> so, you know, of course, we are talking about research projects where we are not at, you know, TRL four or five is a bit nonsense, but if it is a bit higher, the sooner the better, because the market will be the one who will judge you, not the uh, Horizon uh, Europe evaluators. Once the, the project is done, uh, and then that's the hard job is, is, uh, is coming up. So yes, the sooner the better. And this is also one of the lack of the, uh, some research per se projects, that they don't have this sort of maybe competence and I'm very advocating the fact that uh, if a researcher is a good researcher, 
it's not always 100% surely that he might be a good entrepreneur. And the other way around, a good entrepreneur is not a good researcher. He has to do all the entrepreneurship thing, but not the research. So, you know, you, but you need to have this little flavor uh, when you maybe uh, think about a research project. And I'm just asking a question to Gaetano. How many times did you change your business plan or did you change your, uh, your service? I know the answer because uh, uh, I funded you in one of your endeavors when I was in the agency, but how many times? It was not once and then valid for all. I think that it's possible to change the business model or the, 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 the business plan is probably every day or every month you change the number because something changed, you have awareness of another cost, you need to invest more. But the, the vision is, I, I agree with you to go fast to the market. If there is a customer that pay one euro for your research, the research is a success. So don't wait. Okay, I, need, I, I leave in my company the the faith the, the the continuous discussion with people in data science they try to find 90.9 percent of, of uh, accuracy of the algorithm or of the model this is not the right way to conquer the market normally you can go to the market also with 75 percent your customer know that you are offering a minimum viable product, something that is not perfect, but can work. As low functionality can solve the problem, then you can evolve the project, not with your idea or the idea of the developer, but with the idea of the customer. This is something that is really important and I agree with Amin. The researcher is a researcher, the entrepreneur is the entrepreneur. The entrepreneur needs to see the bottom line. I need to pay 20 salary every month, I need to pay the AWS, I need to take money from the market. The research try to find the, per the, the beautiful picture, the, the perfection, and the, the perfection is not good for the market in initial phase. And this is also why in the evaluation of some projects, you don't have only researchers or only, you know, entrepreneurs. Maybe in this, I would ask Stella if you, if you have some, you know, some comment on this. In your evaluation boards for the, for the projects, you don't have, you have a quite a heterogeneous group of people there because you are evaluating different aspects. Correct. Uh, actually, uh, we, when we have the jury members, which is the third phase for the accelerator, it's very diverse. So we have people who are with, of course, technical background, but we also have people who are uh, treating and asking questions with VC background also. And actually, especially for accelerator, commercialization strategy is let's say one of the fundamental and that's why i recommend to all smes and startups in the space industry if you apply for accelerator be very robust on your potential customers a letter of interest and commercialization strategy because these are one of the major pillars on which you will be let's say uh, where you question, where your innovation, your high risk innovation is being questioned, how you would scale up, how you would you commercialize and so on. So you're completely correct, yes. And it is true, we do have bottom up. Our program is also built in such a way, our work program, we have the open, so really bottom up ideas without, uh, and then we, ha we have the top down, which is more on the challenges part. So it is really on a, a lot of the way uh, our proposals are being assessed is like <clears throat> some jury members as VCs assessing a potential high risk innovation. And I was in a info day in Ljubljana a few months ago and there I saw a very interesting presentation of comparing VC investment and EIC investment in high risk, the questions, the process, and so on. So I think that uh, we really, when you pitch in front of the EIC and when you get selected, it's extremely important that you are actually ready to, as you're in front of a VC, 
but not only the business part, but also, of course, the technical part, the innovation part. Thank you, uh, thank you, Stella. As you um, just uh, yeah, mentioned about this, uh, the processes and so on, can you uh, please, uh, in order to uh, maximize the awareness uh, of the attendees, share with us what are the current and uh, ongoing activities at uh, EIC, which support uh, innovators? Of course, of course. Well, first, I would like to tell you more about the role of the EIC. In the space industry, we are relatively, let's say, new player. Uh, and as Alkimars mentioned, we do actually develop game-changing innovations and we do support companies through their commercialization. So we have the Pathfinder, which is TRL1 to TRL4 for consortium. And it's the Pathfinder Open. It's built up on the future emerging tech on the FET program. And it's really bottom-up, high-risk uh, ideas uh, and game-changing innovations. We have projects like using electrodynamic tethers for debris removal and so on. This year, we have a space challenge uh, on the Pathfinder, which is about in-space solar energy harvesting for innovative space applications. And it's going to close on the 18th of October. Then once the projects are finished, they can, from one Pathfinder project, you have the opportunity to apply to transition which is TRL4 to TRL6. And their consortiums, uh, you could be either in a consortium or a single entity. It's to do technology maturation from a proof of concept to validation. And actually here, it's already the commercialization starts. So we have the business acceleration services, the early commercialization. And the projects get 2.5 grand. And the interesting part is I have some Pathfinder project. From one, I get two or three transition, uh, let's say, transition projects applying. And the final one is Accelerator, which is for individual SMEs and startups, which is really scaling up disruptive innovations. And for the Earth observation domain, this year, we have the customer-driven innovative space technologies and services. I know it's much more in the upstream domain, looking at iOS, active debris removal, but we do have one bullet, which is scaling up disruptive innovations for Earth observation. That's for 65 million. Uh, companies get grant 2.5 million and then equity investment up to 15 and above even. So I really, uh, the programs which are open are Pathfinder and Accelerator. Sometimes most of the applicants in Accelerator, they actually apply twice. And I really recommend you to look uh, into uh, these programs. Uh, and next year, we will also have potentially a space challenge. I cannot tell you uh, which domain because the program has not yet been um, voted, but uh, we've been working already on proposing a space challenge for 2024. In the space portfolio, in the accelerator, we have three pillars. One is uh, one of the main ones are Earth observation and meteorology, which in which we have, for example, projects which look at using AI, or AI algorithms for precision agriculture, using Sentinel-2 data, satellite-based SAS, predictive monitoring of critical infrastructure, thermal infrared payloads, the second pillar is on space debris sustainability, uh, monitoring debris, iOS, ADR. And the third one is enabling space technologies. And here, I, I, uh, where we have innovative actuators, high temperature superconductors, iodine proportion. And here, I actually want to uh, mention a huge success uh, in 2023. We had three launches of three projects. Also, we have two of our companies, EIC beneficiaries, Don Aerospace and DG Farm, laureates to ease the rising stars. 
And we have three companies, Constellar, Endurosat, and Prometheus, which are Copernicus program for contributing missions, and also uh, to Casini bus services. Our EIC beneficiaries, we work very well with our colleagues from Pillar uh, 2, D, from DG Davis. Uh, we've signed a common agreement for fast track access of our EIC beneficiaries to the Casini bus services and also to the IOD, IOE flight opportunities. So really, I encourage you to look at our programs. If you don't know, uh, what exactly whether you fit in the space challenge please do look at the accelerator open or uh, the pathfinder open if you feel that your activities don't fit uh, in but please go ahead and don't uh, and be persistent that is my message to you <laughs> thank you uh, stella uh thomas uh... Uh, you have as well on the ESA uh, activities, maybe you, you want to share? Yeah, I mean, uh, at ESA there are several entry points, right? So, uh, of course, we, you can be someone who would like to start a company that could be with the BICS. And of course, then we also have the downfield programs like business applications and space solutions, which are mainly for startup SMEs who are trying to uh, develop a new product or service uh, in their portfolio. So these are for slightly more mature companies. Uh, and then these are tools within ESA that we have had already for quite some time. And now we have also recently, uh, from the last ministerial, have set up the scale-up program. And this is also very much focused towards uh, in investments. So building relationships with investors, um, having a platform where we can aggregate uh, a kind of demand from a, a customer, but also bringing the service uh, supplier together. So this is something we are building. It's still very much in the works. Um, so those are some kind of tools, but I think in a bigger, grander things, we are much more looking at how can we uh, change our ways of working um, by listening, of course, to startups. Uh, one of the things is, of course, speed and time to market which equals time to contract in ESA, uh, ESA speaks. Um, so we are really looking at us, how can we procure in a way uh, that we can, that we don't hold up the startup who has that ambition to hit the market fast. So it's something that we are building on uh, within ESA. Uh, so it's still, I can update you at maybe at later how that's going, but it's something that we are definitely considering and we're definitely listening to the startups uh, which have, uh, have this, expressed this, uh, this need. Thank you, Thomas. Um, well, we are quite close to the end of this, uh, this session and the end of the day. Um, I really would like to have uh, at least one, one comment from uh, each, each of you, each of the panelists, in order to see what could be the, the key takeaway you would recommend or key uh, elements you would like to share to the European Commission in order to, uh, to boost the, the commercialization. Uh, if you have thought how uh, your geo can support it, it is more than welcome, obviously. Okay, uh, yeah, from my side, I think the one of the things to push the commercialization is to add the <clears throat> KPI in, in, in the proposal. So you need to demonstrate that you have some KPI ex ante, how many, for example, during the project I engage two, three, four customers, or I imagine to, to reach one, 10 euro in revenue. Uh, this is important because now all the, pro the project becomes bigger and bigger. And with this bigger project with uh, 31, 32, 40 partners, it's really complicated to define a product at the end of the project. So each one of the partners, we are in a couple of larger projects, we try to commercialize the outcome of the of, uh, of the R and D outside the consortium because it's complicated with you have different companies with different vision. And the second aspect is to uh, give a value on the market, the go to market of R&D. Typical, the go to market strategy in, in R&D project is not, uh, probably in AC, I know very well AC, the go to market is a key part of the evaluation. Probably in R&D project is not so important. 
the, there is the, the, the impact, but is more on dissemination and engagement, not in go to market. I, I am also an evaluator, for example, in Eureka or other projects, and I saw that a lot, I am really uh, selective uh, because the go to market is fundamental for Cascade founder project very close to the market. Probably EU needs to be more similar to ESA. For example, in ESA, this, uh, in uh, ESA project, this is most, most important. Thank you. If there is. Thanks. Um, I don't know if it's so much a recommendation or, or rather something that I would hope more will be done going forward. And actually, we are committed ourselves to support that, hopefully through the Euro Geosec project as well. With, when we didn't mention it here, because one common thing that happens is that we're talking about research projects. It's usually not just a single entity that participates in these projects, and it's not a single entity developing the solution. And often what happens is that at the end of the project, you have different parts of the solution being built by different entities. So it's a question, how do we now exploit the different you know, parts of the IP? And I mean, we had a, a first effort in that initiative, it worked with mixed results, but I still believe that there is a lot of good IP that is being created and then just stays in this sort of limbo state. Mm -hmm. And I would very much want to see, and again, we, are committed, we have some ideas of how we can pursue that, ways to not let this IP just be wasted. Mm -hmm. Uh, sorry, I will need to go and take pick up my kids from the school. Is it possible that I mention my thoughts? I'm really sorry. I really have these family constraints. So uh, I think the European Innovation Council is very much, uh, let's say, an important player, particularly on the commercialization and encouraging new Space companies. Actually, we were one of the first ones many years ago to fund companies like Deorbit, like Indurusat, ICE, through our previous programs. Uh, I think it's great that we're different from the European Space Agency. I think we're complementary. We're not in competition. Uh, and uh, actually, my colleagues from DG DEFIS have been building very good cooperation on the capacity building. Uh, in Europe on space. And last week I was at, the, and I think Lefteris was also there, we were at a workshop called Space Investment uh, and uh, organized by the European Investment Bank. And there we saw all the stakeholders in one table talking to each other, being open, honest and transparent. And I think that's most important that we trust each other and we work together. I have projects. Uh, which work together under ESA Incubed program, under ESA Artis, under ESA Sunrise, and the other way around. And I think we can only succeed and encourage the growth of the European new space industry and SMEs and startups only if we support them, all of us together, and not fight on a political level, but exactly on an industrial, help them be competitive, do our best. And I think that's what we're doing in the last year. That's my only remark. Thank you. Thank you, Stella. Oh, well, um, just one thing. Uh, um, as uh, uh, demonstrated by the uh, ERSC study about the state of industry, we have a downstream market that have a value of about uh, 1.8 billion. Just no nuts. Uh, so when we think to development of this market, uh, we also uh, think strategically about the fact that we don't let too much in the end of commercial cycle, for example because the resource uh, uh, preparation and uh, even startup growth is uh, as fast as we can. <laughs> it's not a very short process. And uh, in this, uh, I believe that an approach from uh, the Commission, European government and ISA of, uh, uh, in, in competition to what happened in US, that's, uh, if the slogan uh, uh, buy what you can build what you need uh, is a must also on the side of the pond thank you okay, thank you
about uh, the complementarity between uh, European Space Agency and uh, the Commission projects. It's uh, really tough to succeed in, um, let's say, in doing a really, uh, to reach the market through um, European community funded project because uh, the, the partnership is too wide. There are a lot uh, of uh, also competitors uh, with you working on specific target. So uh, <laughs> there is uh, some, uh, let's say, ambiguous uh, areas uh, that have to be taken into account. With the European Space Agency opportunities, it seems more uh, uh, easy, the, um, the roll-up of the project, the approach to the market, because you can shape your, uh, your partnership with the ones that will be your partner uh, in the development of the product. Uh, so, okay, they are complementary and we as company try to exploit the best from these uh, two sets of opportunities. Uh, some additional remarks maybe about the, uh, all the stuff related to business plan, business model and so on, because all this project and opportunity asks to the companies, on, to the partners uh, to write down specific uh, documentation about that. I think that uh, we are now all uh, acquainted to, to produce realistic business plan, but uh, maybe there should be more attention to real business plan. And so maybe it's not just the processes and the procedures that we, uh, we learned to use, but also to understand if there is a really an intimacy with the market, the really end users that are uh, uh, supporting the process. So maybe some KPI also in the evaluation uh, both from uh, European Space Agency and uh, the Commission should be great to have. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I would also like to, to remark you know, the importance of the cooperation between the different players. Uh, not only yeah, the, the European uh, uh, Commission uh, players, but also the, the public and private players. You no, know, and, and, um, Coming back to, to the innovation procurement, I believe that the public authority not only can, as I mentioned, no, uh, support commercialization, but has the responsibility to do it and not to, to let the, the research die no, after it's complete, but also uh, make this uh, process to go to the market easier and in some way, right? And I also agree what it was said about the importance of uh, distributing the intellectual property rights. Uh, because uh, in innovation procurement, this is also a key point, not only between the, the consortium, no, in case of, of different uh, companies uh, going together to the tender, but also between the, the companies and the public buyers. And we also, we uh, always advise to leave the intellectual property right with the contractors. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you are uh, hinder the future commercialization, mm -hmm. and this is not a... Uh, uh, positive at all. So that's, that will be my key, uh, key takeaways for today. Thank you. Uh, well, my key takeaway, or just to answer your question, what um, Eurogeo can do is um, find a kitty and transform it in a tiger, just to conclude as, as I started. So, um, and this is maybe something that, again, we don't want to terraform a researcher in making the researcher an entrepreneur. But um, if you guys, as you have all, you know, uh, the range of different projects uh, or um, entities participating in projects and doing so, why don't you maybe organize something or some activities or initiatives to give this kind of flavor? Um, some flavor on entrepreneurship, some flavor on business modeling, some flavor on IP and, and so on. Um, IP is more and more seen as uh, I need to patent because if I patent and my research department has a patent, I will get more score for the next year and I can get more funding from the government. No, it's like why you are patenting. Mm. Are you going to use this patent for, to do something else or, or not? Mm. And uh, I'm sorry, Stella had, had to go, but of course uh, uh, she had to. 
Um, but um, plenty of opportunities, ESA, uh, EIC, USPA, DigiDefis, and a lot of, but administrative uh, burdens are still there. Hmm. So it took, I don't know how much to um, submit a proposal and then, you know, the paperwork, get the approval. And then before you start, these are not the time is good for, for startups or for research projects who want to exploit that, uh, that result. So, and this has been an issue for almost 20, 25 years. I started my very first European project was FP5. And, and in FP5, there was the same problem. FP5, FP6, FP7, and then Horizon 2020, Horizon Europe. So it's not all, you know, uh, nice and good. There are some things to, to fix, but you know, Geo can, can connect and play a role in that. Find a kitty and transform it in a tiger. Great. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I think it was also mentioned by Stella. I, I think um, collaboration also on an institution level is key. Between all the different tools that we have, I think we have to kind of do a, a sort of a better coordination, how we can map and make it a bit more clear as well to the industry of what, the, what all the offers are and how we can kind of coexist and work well together. Uh, I think that is uh, yeah, a very a valid point that by Stella and I only agree with that. Um, yeah, maybe for Eurogeo, uh, I also think, yeah, perhaps uh, going forward, maybe a focus on commercialization, business models, how, how you can scale business, I think would be a, a great addition because, yeah, I've been here today. Um, I, I missed this a little bit, uh, but uh, perhaps for going forward, uh, it would be a nice, uh, a nice addition. Mm -hmm. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, I would like to open the floor to uh, all the people in the room or online. Is there any last question? Yes, to uh, maybe first to uh, Erwin or the European Commission. Yes, thanks for this interesting discussion. I was just wondering, as you know, in our R&D calls in Horizon, previously Horizon 2020, we have on a regular basis innovation actions where we call for a commercial application using EO data. Huh? And I must admit indeed that not always a success is really extreme. Huh? So we have some good case videos and also some failures. Now, um, hearing these discussions, inevitably due to the eligibility criteria, you always uh, join up as said left with either joint exploitation or scattered R&D. Um, uh, and Cecilia said that the R&D plan should from the start cover all necessary expertise in your company. So that's, that's indeed an issue, I guess. Also, the, I like the, the eye of the tiger idea, but from, uh, from a proposal, from evaluating the proposal, it's very hard to, to see the eye. Huh? Mm -hmm. And does this mean that we should not have this kind of calls anymore? It's, it's wasted money. We should go for research innovation actions and then the IC accelerator, or do you still see some value into that? Maybe it's a, it's a question you can't answer, but it's in my head, so <laughs> thanks. Thank you, Erwin. Um, Bente? Okay, yeah, so now I will put on a different hat, uh, the digital twin of the ocean hat. Uh, we have uh, in this project, Ilya, the digital twin of the ocean, we, it's an innovation action, meaning that we are closer to market and we have a number of different twins addressing aquaculture, fisheries, new energy, etc. Now, uh, I actually would like to invite you uh, to consider joining uh, the community that we are creating uh, around the business part of the, the digital twins. Because we are in this project, we are integrating the business modeling, uh, providing uh, competence and support to the digital twins, because uh, those who are developing the twins, some of them have clients already, so that's easier, but others are completely uh, innovation or technology and science driven. So we have a mix of it. What we want to do is to create a community, uh, both with ESA, ESA is, you know, and uh, EIC, and you know, you have different um, communities all interested in this. So I just wanted to say that we are, you know, <laughs> having this uh, laboratory, if you like, with, uh, you know, quite a few uh, twins. And uh, you will see um, an invitation to, uh, to a webinar where we are starting this discussion. So it will be lovely to, uh, to have you on board on that. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Bente. 
so uh, I would like to say first, thank you. Thank you to all of you uh, as, a, as a panelist and, and attendees. Um, if I just have to have some keywords that we heard uh, from all the, the different contribution, uh, we heard a lot about, uh, well, market knowledge, uh, business plan, yes, access to communities and strong links, daily connection with them, and uh, as well, bridge research and, and enterprise. So uh, this thing, I think, was our little pillar that uh, we will uh, have to develop in the uh, ongoing activities. And uh, for sure, you can contact us uh, to support this. So thank you to all of you uh, for your valuable contribution. And uh, we are on time. Thank you.